Good morning, everybody. Good morning again. Um, here, I don't... here we go. Well, here we are again, friends. It's that time. Um, we, uh, we are going through a fall series where we're taking a look at kind of expounding on what our name means. And as we went through this process this last year of choosing a name, um, the immediate heart behind it was somebody came to me and said, hey, I know you're thinking about a name. Here's a name. What do you think of this? And then somebody they hadn't talked to in our church had the same idea. And I thought, ooh, God might be up to something here. And so then as we were progressing along, this is the name that bubbled to the top and our council voted and we decided to go forward with the name Anchor of Hope Church. And so the title for our series is really, We Are Anchor of Hope. And as we've been talking about name change, I know that one of the big concerns has been that somehow we are going to slip into some of the errors that other churches face when they start making some more seismic shifts in what they do. Um, let me reassure you that uh, we are still a Bible-based church. We believe the Bible. We submit to the Bible. Um, as is clear in our membership vows, uh, the very first thing we ask is, do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Um, and we submit to uh, what God has said. Uh, another thing I want to just calm any fears that might be out there, uh, we are still, um, within the purest sense of the word, evangelical. And what I mean by that word, as the Bible word that it is, is that we are people of good news. We are defined by the gospel. And so even within the name Anchor of Hope, I wanted to pursue grappling with what does the Bible say about hope. And so I pulled out uh, my dusty Strong's Concordance that I, I, I have it on my laptop most of the time, but I decided this calls for the, the physical copy, the real deal. And I found that there are reasons why I like the real deal a bit more. <laughs> but I'll, ask me sometime, I'll share that with you. Um, but I have an, an exhaustive concordance with the NASB, and I went through, um, in the last two weeks, all like 200 verses, Old and New Testament, where the word hope is used. And um, it it was a humbling experience because in some regard, the Old Testament, the Hebrew language is so nuanced. There's like eight words at least that mean hope. Or there's even one, I love this, that means false hope. Why I love that is there's only one verse in all the Bible that uses that one particular word, and it means false hope. And so it kind of describes this whole dynamic of there's things you hope in and things you don't hope in. And the things you should not hope in, those are the things that really your hope, it's a false hope. It's something that you shouldn't put your trust in. And so my findings was that basically the Bible boils it down to this. Put your hope in God. If you don't, if you put your hope in any other thing, you're on shaky ground at best. It's not going to work out well for you. And so even within our title, Anchor of Hope, as a name for our, our body, really we are clinging to something that is secure, something that is um, not going to fail us, that is meant to really root us in our faith. So what is that anchor? Well, it's not just anchor of hope, but it's that that hope is Jesus. That hope 
Uh, one of the verses, I, I'm, it's escaping me at the moment, but um, one of those verses, it talks about how Jesus is our hope. It also talks about how eternal life is a hope that we have as followers of Jesus. And so the title for today's sermon, as we really kick off this fall series, is communicating hope. Because as you may have been able to tell if you were following me through that little bit of rabbit trails, um, it <laughs> uh, hope is a, both a, a simple thing and also a big thing in the Bible. And what we mean by hope is a unique thing. The main passage, we're not going to spend a ton of time in it, but it's kind of, we're talking about the vision today of, of our church, communicating hope, uh, I, is found in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4. And the big idea, it's really, it's the vision for our church in this season. It's that we would be a people who are restoring hope in our community one person at a time. And we're going to unpack that this morning. You can go to the next slide there. Um, last week, we read from Hebrews chapter 6, where it says, now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. Like, cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, right? Uh, I hope that's not binding, because I said that a lot as a kid. Anyway, uh, God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Amen? So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him, that is God, for refuge, can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You may go to the next slide as well. So in thinking about hope, I just wanted to give kind of a picture. I was uh, surfing on YouTube. Some of you do that, I know. And uh, one of the videos that popped up on my feed was this restoration of an 1871 candy drop maker. So you have the rusty one on. That was the before picture. Um, and it this video walked you through the process of this person who's just incredibly skilled at restoring things, uh, taking this rusty piece of an antiquity and really restoring it into the beautiful piece of machinery that it was designed to be. Um, now, I don't know if the original color was really that candy apple red. I think that was a little bit of flourish here and there. Um, and I don't know if, if that uh, center column, if those, uh, if those two rollers are actually gold or, or if that was just sprayed on there. I didn't pay too close attention to that. But my point is, it was a process of this person, I'm assuming it was just one person, of restoring this, this thing, this object. How much more is there a process when... God is restoring us and is restoring really our hope in him as we are on a journey oriented toward him, toward his life, his purposes for us. How much more is there just a process where he is at work restoring us? And so there you go. That's the illustration. You can go to the next slide. Um, I mentioned how I was trying to develop this kind of whole, no, 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 yep, yep, you're good. Uh, <laughs> this whole big picture Bible theology of hope, trying to figure out what does the word hope mean? What does the Bible say it means? And um, after all my searching, I was trying to come up with it. I looked it up on my software on my computer, and they have this beautiful, wonderful, synergized statement. It says, Hope is the confidence that by integrating God's redemptive acts in the past with trusting human responses in the present, the faithful, that's us, 
will experience the fullness of God's goodness both in the present and in the future. What does that mean? It means that when God reveals himself to us, he reveals himself first as Savior, as rescuer, as deliverer, as the one who can uh, lead us out of darkness and into his light. And we see that all throughout the scriptures. Even in the book of Job, where uh, um, it's the word that both Job and Psalms, it's where the word hope shows up the most. I, I don't think that's by accident. But in each of those cases, it's a hoping in God. It's placing our trust in God and on God as a sure, confident foundation. And so I love how it's, it's linking these, where it's got, God is doing something and we're responding to that thing, where we are trusting in him. He saves us and, and we're going along with it and we are learning how to trust him more and more as we walk throughout this life. And that is the hope that we carry with us. And that's where also we get to experience God's goodness and fullness here and now. But it's also an expectation, as we see in the New Testament, that there is a future for us that lies beyond the gateway of death and into eternity wherever we end up spending that time. And there is a future, and there is a good future for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Now you can go to the next slide. Okay, so let's unpack the phrase. Restoring hope in our community one person at a time. Starting with restoring hope. Now, I have up on the screen just two verses, but I'd like to go back to uh, verses one and two. It's not on the slides, Richard. Um, so uh, Isaiah chapter 61 um, this is quoted by Jesus and is often referred to as the mission of God in the Old Testament. It says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, um, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory." They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. Restoring hope. So the picture, when, when an organization uh, tries to, to develop a phrase that they call a vision statement, what they're really trying to get at is, this is what we want to see that we would like to see this thing happen. And I've been at many churches with many different vision statements all rooted in scripture. And our vision statement, restoring hope in our community, it starts with restoring hope in that picture of what would it look like to restore hope in our community. And I love just the contrast of, you know, a crown of beauty for ashes. You know, that joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. And there are a lot of people in our community who may not be walking with the Lord right now. Maybe they were at one time, and maybe they're not now, or maybe they never have, and they, they're just walking in darkness. These are people where ashes, that's a very real thing that they might be dealing with, not not literal ashes, but where <laughs> what I mean is in life where they are experiencing a humbling in their life, where uh, the storms of life are just beating them down time and time again. And, you know, no matter how hard they try, no matter what they try to put their hope in, whether it's a substance or whether it's a relationship or whether it's 
TV, for goodness sake. Like, you know, whatever it might be, they're putting their trust in something because life's getting them down. Somehow that's happening. There are people who are mourning in our communities, mourning the loss of a loved one, even mourning the, you know, the, the, the terminal news uh, like our friend Jody has kind of received with the, the diagnosis of cancer, though her faith is strong. You know, there are people where just the word cancer cripples them. And it's like just a gut punch of, oh, even just the word COVID, and I'm probably going to get flagged now on Facebook for saying that, but, you know, um, even just saying the word COVID or pandemic, it's like a gut punch, whether that's things that they have personally experienced or that, you know, I, I remember the first time I got sick around the time when COVID was in its height in our area in Portland, and I didn't have COVID, but I thought, this is it. Jesus, take me now. <laughs> like, what is this? I'm not ready to go. I had a Hezekiah moment. <laughs> and um, just like, Lord, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to go. <laughs> um, and I was like the poster child of at risk <laughs> and these different things. I, I don't mean to make light of that, but I was feeling that gut punch of, oh, man, things are not good. And there are people in our community who are feeling, oh, Things are not good, and they're despairing, and they're mourning, and they need hope. Even you, here this morning, you need hope. There are things I don't even know what's going on with you, <laughs> but you do, and the Lord does, and you need hope. How can we be a people who are restoring hope, where we would get to see in our community hope in God restored. Chew on that. The next phrase, in our community. Uh, this last year, we have periodically been on a journey through the book of Matthew. We've taken a bit of a pause from that. But when we were in the book of Matthew, we were talking through the Sermon on the Mount this last fall, uh, this spring, excuse me. Um, and Jesus said to his disciples and the people who were following him there, he said, to them this. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is it if as, is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The, the reason I'm, I'm, I, I am, I, I, I'm taking this verse a little out of context, if you will. And if you want more context, we have a sermon online for that. Here's the point. You, as a follower of Jesus... You, your identity, your quality is that you are both salt and light. That's what Jesus calls you. And there are different reasons for that. We won't go into all of them. But one of the things that salt does is it is a mighty influencer. Sometimes I like a whole lot more salt than most people do. <laughs> but that's also, you know, salt, it gives flavor. It seasons things. It, it seasons whatever food you're trying to do. It, it heals. There's so much that salt can be used for, but it is a, a, a causal influencing agent where it is, and usually you spread it out or you have some kind of way of spreading it. There are places where you go that I may never go. There are places that you have influence that I'm never going to have influence. Relationships that you have where you get to be a representation and of the quality of that hope that God gives, that you've experienced, you get to share that in your community. And as we all are doing that, 
then we get to see the other picture where we are like light, where the more concentrated little light bulbs get together, the more light you have, um, unless they're LEDs, and then you just have huge beacon of light <laughs> everywhere. But the point is this, in our community, we are called to be salt and light. We're supposed to be influencers in our community and not the other way around. We are to be, yes, in our community, but we're not supposed to just let people just influence us because after all, what if the salt loses its flavor? What if the salt gets contaminated in some way or diluted too much? Then you don't have salt, you just have sand. Is that right? I don't know. She's doing all the science stuff with Ruben now, and so I'm like, that sounds good. I don't know. <laughs> but, but yeah, you just, you don't have salt anymore, really, at that point. You don't have that influencing agent. And so in our community, I would submit to you that us as individual believers and us as a church, because we are a small pocket of our community here in Florence, that we are meant to be restoring hope in our community as well. The final statement, one person at a time. So uh, in the book of Acts, when Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, he, he is laying out for his disciples, you know, wait for the Holy Spirit's going to come. Um, so the disciples, uh, they said uh, they were with Jesus. They kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? This was that messianic hope that they were expecting God to come down and set everything right as it was supposed to be. Jesus replied to them, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I think this is a very key, pivotal section for us as the church. Not just because it's right before the birth of the church when Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost and lots of people started believing and all of that. This is pivotal because so oftentimes we have this big picture view where God wants us to go into all nations and make disciples of the whole world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that great commission. We have that vision, and that is good. We don't want to get rid of that vision. Yet, what I love about this phrase is that it takes that big picture view and it boils it down to small, measurable things that you can actually attain. There is a whole big world out there, but what if I just started in my neighborhood? What if I just started in my community? You know, the state of Oregon, we're a pretty big place. We're not as big as Texas, but we're a pretty big place compared to other states in our union and so if, if my goal was, let's get the gospel out to the whole state of Oregon, that's awesome, but I got to start somewhere. And Jesus' instructions was that he, he told them to start in Jerusalem. And then he also said, okay, now there's the surrounding area, Judea. And then there's Samaria, the place you don't really like to go, but there's that too, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' call to us is to start small. And we are positioned really well to start small. And that, I think, is the beauty of us as a local church and how we can partner with what God wants to do in this community by restoring hope in our community one person at a time. Now, you can go to the final slide as we transition to communion. I got to wrap this thing up. Here we go. So we are anchor of hope. What that means is that for you personally, God is with you 
everywhere you go. When you are going through the storms of this life, and it feels like the wind and the waves are just beating against you and you can't t catch a break at all. Jesus is with you, just like an anchor in a boat. You got to have your anchor or else you got foolish sailing going on. That's, that's all there is to it. And that's not going to be very helpful to you as you journey through this life. For us as a group of people, Jesus is with us, and we get to be a witness to people of the hope that we found in Christ. Amen? Now, as a celebration of that hope, we're going to uh, partake of communion together. Um, what I'd like to do different this morning is that um, the worship team, you're going to come up, and we're going we're gonna to sing uh, a good hymn that really encapsulates what Jesus did for us. Um, and as we do, um, uh, I guess ushers who were going to help pass things out, uh, one of them is going to stand here, the other one's going to stand here. And uh, I'd invite you to come forward and receive the elements. We're, we're doing it a little different than normal because I think that worship, it, it necessitates our participation, um, us responding. If this word that I've shared with you this morning, it's more of a homily, it's not an expository, you know, digging deep into all the words of every, uh, of things within the passage, but if what we've been talking about this morning has impacted you in some way, I'd encourage you to come forward. You are welcome at the table. What, um, what I love about getting to facilitate these moments is that uh, we practice something called open communion, which means that you don't have to be a formal member of our church to take the elements. Uh, all that I'd ask is that you have some kind of a faith in Jesus, that you are oriented in some way towards him where you've heard about him, and you are taking even just one small step of faith in his direction. Because we're remembering ultimately what he did for us on the cross, where he shed his blood, he offered up his body as an atoning sacrifice for my sins and for your sins. And it doesn't stop there. It is a living hope that we have. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again. And we can have new life as we participate with him.